The ideal figure of the scripture is not a bureaucrat, a functionary, or a self-esteem expert. The ideal figure of the scripture is a warrior king. This king is long foretold in the Bible. Just after the fall of Adam, the first priest king, we learn of another king to come. The coming king does not venture here to listen to the serpent, to negotiate with the serpent, or to try to understand the serpent's perspective on various matters. The warrior king comes to crush the head of the serpent. Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The warrior king comes to deal out death to the enemy of God and his people. The warrior king is foreshadowed throughout the Old Testament. David is the greatest of this line, but David does not act alone. He draws a band of mighty men who rally to him and fight for him without a second thought. David's entire ministry as king of Israel is staked on courage. He did what no one else would do in facing down Goliath. Men don't follow titles. Men follow courage. For that costly courage, David became the greatest leader in Israel's history. But David was not the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. Like Joshua, Moses, and other heroic figures, David fell short. Every biblical leader falls short, just as every historical leader falls short. No, the fulfillment of the Proto-Evangelion was not David. It was Christ Jesus. Jesus did not come to earth to make peace with the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 3.8. Consider also Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. This is warrior language, clear and unmistakable. It reframes our understanding of Jesus, canceling any plans we might have to see Jesus as a victim or even as a well-intentioned servant alone. Jesus came to do terrible violence to the prince of hell, and the demons indeed knew he came to overcome them. See Luke 4, 31 to 37. The title Matthew gives Jesus in his very first verse of so many verses is this, Son of David. First title with all that entailed. This warrior identity, Davidic identity, was not a wrinkle in the whole Bible doctrine of God. Think of the words of Exodus. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name, Exodus 15.3. As a man of war, a warrior, Jesus came to destroy, but not only to destroy, to conquer and to enact the full and glorious reign of his kingship on earth. So Edwards said about Christ, he appeared as a lamb. Yea, he was a lamb actually slain by this lion, that is Satan. Yet, as the lion of the tribe of Judah, he, Jesus, conquers and triumphs over Satan, destroying his own destroyer, as Samson did the lion that roared upon him when he rent him as he would a kid. Jesus did indeed conquer Satan, but he did so in a most unexpected way by laying his life down in order to propitiate the wrath of God and cleanse guilty sinners. Think of the language of Colossians 2, verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. This is your king. This is Jesus. He's reigning now. This victory is his. No one can change it. No one can alter it. John Stott puts it helpfully. What looks like and indeed was the defeat of goodness by evil at the cross is also and more certainly the defeat of evil by goodness. Overcome there at Calvary, he was himself overcoming, crushed by the ruthless power of Rome. He was himself crushing the serpent's head. The victim was the victor and the cross is still the throne from which he rules the world. Christ's death, we can say then, broke the power of sin by fulfilling all the righteous demands of God and taking the rightful penalty for sinners like us. 
Jesus serves us, you could say, by triumphing over Satan for us. A defeat, a triumph we could never enact for ourselves. We could never achieve in our own strength. You see just how great the effect of the cross is when you think of that. Could you triumph over the devil? Can you triumph over the devil for 10 seconds in your own strength? The answer is no. And yet Jesus completely destroyed this figure, this satanic anti-king. Henri Blachet says it well. How have the brothers overcome the devil and his host? Not by superior might on your part, on my part, but by the blood of the lamb. Revelation 12, 11. Satan was the accuser and he prevailed as long as he could point to their sins, your sins. But the blood of the lamb was the price paid for the cancellation of their debt. So we say this, in the death and resurrection of Jesus, the reign of God, the kingship of God, so long awaited, took full shape and form. This reign is not presently finalized, but it is actualized, and no one can stop it. Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. How's that for a benediction tossed off at the end of a service? No one, I repeat myself, can stop the warrior king, and no one will stop the warrior king. Warriors are everywhere and nowhere today. In one sense, they're all over the silver screen, aren't they? In our never-ending superhero series. Series of series of series. The superhero films, have you seen them? There's like 12 Avengers films and, and then others, dynasties are cropping up. Warriors. Warriors are everywhere. They're all over the screen. We are spending, in a global sense, billions of dollars to watch the modern incarnation iteration of warriors. We're obsessed with them. It seems to be just about the only kind of movie we can make today. In another sense, warriors have mostly disappeared in any positive form from classrooms, lecture halls, online articles, and churches. This disjunction of interest tells us much about where we are as a culture today. We crave heroes, especially men of virtue, who sacrificially risk their lives to save others. That is the superhero trope. Those are the superhero films people are going to see. Primarily men, at least in many cases men, who do what? Use their strength, put their lives on the line to bless and save others. Yes? That's what people are not spending hundreds of dollars on, millions of dollars on, it's what they're spending billions of dollars on. So figure out the next major superhero series and you have it made in the shade. We are trained today though, strangely, to see aggressive men, just that type, the superhero type, yes? To see those men as examples of toxic masculinity. So we're of two minds. You see this? Double-minded culture, ready? A secular, God-denying culture is always, in some form, going to be double-minded. It can't avoid it. On the one hand, we want warriors to keep us safe. And this is true, actually, not just in the cinematic form. It's true in the actual militaristic form. Because there are actually tens and tens of thousands of soldiers, hundreds of thousands of soldiers right now, warriors, who actually are keeping us safe. Yes? At any given moment. Some of you have family members. Many of you have military service members in your church in some form. Those figures, those warriors are keeping us safe in many senses. On the other hand, though, even as we want warriors to keep us safe, we don't want to encourage the culture that would breed those warriors. We don't want that kind of manhood. So we want that manhood, yes, and we don't want it. And so we are a double-minded culture. Our culture, you see, has shifted to a gender-neutral mode, and so we cannot discuss the nature of manhood in a strong biblical sense, certainly. We can't even discuss today how men and women are different. We're not even really allowed to do that. We can't celebrate the goodness of manhood. We certainly can't give a statistic like, uh, according to the Mayo Clinic, this. 
men on average have a thousand percent more testosterone than women. That's not an incidental statistic, is it? That explains for some of us the winter months we just survived, yes, where all the kids were ping-ponging off the walls if you have four seasons as we do in Kansas City. We had, we had a winter. Uh, I'm from Maine, so I'm used to real winter, but I'm, I'm living through synthetic winter and I prefer it. I mean, it's nice. But especially the boys, yes? Some of you are mothers. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, you, you know as a dad what it's like to be tackled when you come through the door after a long, long day in winter months? Well, listen, all kids have plenty of energy at, the, at a young age uh, in general terms. Boys on average have a thousand percent more testosterone than girls. Who has ever heard that, that stat? Who's ever heard that? This is a conservative crowd that believes in the kind of vision of manhood I'm talking about, and I think I saw two hands. You see, we don't talk about this. You get this? Friends, we don't talk about this in the church. It's not just the culture out there. Boys don't know who they are. Boys don't know what makes them different from girls. We live in this reality. We live in a reality where boys have this testosterone, but we can't talk about it. It's against the rules. Someone has determined that we can't say these basic constitutive realities, and that is to the detriment of us all. Testosterone's effects are neither all good nor all bad. Testosterone, as I've been at pains to say here, is the biological ingredient in boys and men that makes them itchy, eager for physical contact, desirous of challenges and adventures, some of them ill-starred and ill-fated. Our culture no longer celebrates these kind of qualities at least in the elite sectors. Today, in fact, a good number of boys who are stereotypically masculine are placed on medication that affects them in a major way and dampens the effects of their God-given body. Some boys need medication. Some boys need medical help in this form. A lot of boys today need not medication, but a man. They need a father. They need a father to pay them mind and play with them and love them. And, and be gracious to them and pick them up when they fall down and correct them firmly. They need that kind of man. This kind of society is dangerous. It's kindling. It's ready to burn. Pretending boys aren't masculine is not a way to solve any of our problems. It is a way to fan our problems into, into flame. 24 out of 25 recent school shooters, for example, are disaffected young men many of them from divorced homes, many of them who have never had a father in any meaningful way raise them up. That is the kind of stat, again, you will not find. People do not talk about it. Maybe they say it very quickly and then they glance over it. That's the story. There's not a lot of other elements to the story in a lot of the cases if you read up on these shooters. It is in many cases that they did not have a father that they are from a broken home. Some of you have suffered through a broken home. Some of you know what this is like. Some of you know the emotions that, that roil in you when this happens to you. And you know the yearning and the longing you have for a father. A yearning in human terms that does not go away necessarily. Not everything in, in a perfect kind of bow on it way resolves in this life, thankfully, we go beyond human terms as Christians, don't we? Because in Christ, we gain a Savior, and we know the Heavenly Father, the one who never leaves, never breaks up a marriage, and never deserts his wife and children. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. Men are tuned out like never before today, and many boys rarely encounter a healthy, plugged-in, caring, strong man. I read a story in a periodical. Um, you see him on the, you know, the newsstands at the airport or whatever. It was a guy. It wasn't a Christian magazine, and it wasn't a guy making a Christian point, but he talked about how he was in, I think, Camden, New Jersey. And he, he was a young man. He liked baseball. He was in a, a, a neighborhood that had a ton of children in broken homes, and no one organized them to play any sports. And so he decided very simply, to start a kind of little league baseball outfit. And he was 
almost instantly after starting it, swarmed by boys. Boys who would, he, he, he wrote, gaze up at him and wonder when they, when they thought he wasn't looking because they effectively hadn't seen a man. They weren't around a man. They didn't know how he acted and how he looked and talked and why he smelled this way and these sorts of things. They were fascinated by the very idea of manhood and much more than that. They craved, they craved a virtuous man to invest in them, to help them, to strengthen them, to teach them, and they didn't have that. This is, this is a story that goes far beyond this one example in New Jersey. This kind of story is playing out everywhere, white collar sectors, blue collar sectors, everything in between in America today and the West. Young women desiring marriage today are languishing, many of them, because of this kind of situation. Marriages that are formed in our time are often rudderless, without direction. Children are brought into the world, but with precious little investment and manly guidance. What is to be done? What are we to do? We're in the ashes. What should we do? Give up? What should we do? Curse the darkness? There's much to say here. But I believe we have one major move that we can make. And just about one. We have to train men in the image of the warrior king, Christ Jesus. The first duty of the warrior is not to learn how to strike or defend or think through battlefield tactics. The first duty of the warrior is to discipline himself in order to be able to protect others. To understand such discipline, we have to remember the Apostle Paul's use of the athlete motif in 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 27. I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. The very foundation of Paul's ministry, then, is gospel-powered self-control. Paul's ministry is not about raw talent or his family background or even his rabbinic training. Paul's ministry is grounded in athlete-like discipline. What is an athlete but a warrior at play? Hupa piazzo mu to soma kai du lagago. I batter my body is a more literal rendering of verse 27, and bring it under servitude. This is the core of being an athlete, and like it, a warrior. You are disciplined in extremity, and nothing could go against the spirit of the age, and with special regard to men, more than this. We are in an age, men, that encourages us at every turn to be undisciplined, soft, uncontrolled, not responsive to authority, nobody over us, do what we want, make excuses when things go wrong. We're in this kind of age. And Paul says to us, almost 2,000 years ago, I batter my body. I subdue my body. I bring it under control. I do this in order that I would not perish in hell eternally but that I would live forever with Christ Jesus and make good on this ministry in his infinite mercy he has handed me. The stakes are very high, aren't they, when it comes to your personal discipline. You don't want to disqualify yourself. The stakes are high indeed. Jesus was incredible as a man. This is the kind of man Jesus was. Jesus makes Paul look like a grasshopper. Jesus was so disciplined and so controlled. We're not used to talking about Jesus as a man, are we? We're used, to, we're used to talking about gender neutral Jesus, okay? We can talk about Jesus for the whole church. Of course, we have to. Jesus is for the whole church. Jesus doesn't die for a tribe of men who put war paint on their faces or something like this. He dies for a whole church. He himself is the maker of all things. He makes male and female in his image for his glory. And yet there is something too, isn't there, to thinking through who Jesus actually was. He actually was a man, and his maleness is not incidental to his identity. 
If you, if you identified Jesus as a man, he wouldn't have, oh, no, 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 sorry. I'm just a human. He, he would have affirmed you if you identified him as a man. This is so basic as to sound silly up here saying it, but it is absolutely essential to recognize. You can't downplay who Jesus actually was. Jesus was able to withstand ferocious hunger. Jesus was able to continually minister to needy people who asked him for help. They had the spiritual gift of asking him for help at all the wrong times. Some of you resonate. Jesus was gentle when needed. Jesus was strong and unbending when needed. Jesus would throw down when needed. Jesus was consummately self-possessed at all times, never succumbing to easy temptation. The foundation of such a life for we who would follow the God-man is to emulate Paul who emulated Christ. The first duty of every man is to do what Paul did. Discipline his body. Discipline your body. A major part of this discipline is sexual discipline. Let's now quickly consider three biblical entailments of the call to warrior discipline with regard to sexuality. First, we men must discipline ourselves to kill lust. We must discipline ourselves to kill lust. If men are to thrive in the image of Christ, the warrior king, we men must kill our lusts. Please note my language. I did not say we should bounce our eyes. I did not say we should remember how broken we are. I said we should kill lust. And by this I mean, not that we would kill it in a kind of way that would make it feel like it wasn't being killed. I mean that we should kill lust by hunting it down like a Navy SEAL swimming upstream with black paint under his eyes and a knife clenched beneath his teeth. What did Paul say? You say, whoa, Strand, militaristic, bro. That's a little warrior, man. Come on. Call it back. Call it back a little. Dial it down. Paul said, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you? What is that? That's visceral language, isn't it? That's for the whole church, too. I mean, that is hunt it down, double-sided blade kind of language. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you? What is the first thing he says to put to death? Porneon, sexual immorality. What did he say in Titus 2.6 and following? Verse 6, likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. And then verse 11 comes in as well. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live what? Self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You say, man, we're in such an unself-controlled age. This is wild. Why are we here in the 21st century? Why is the West burning down? Why does nobody seem to agree about basic things about manhood, womanhood, marriage, sexuality, these kind of things? This is where the Apostle Paul was. This is where the Apostle Peter was. They were in context that would make modern-day cities in America, blush. Listen, the church has gone through this before. The church has been surrounded, as Josh mentioned last session, by paganism. We're surrounded increasingly by it today. It's back. We thought it went away. We thought it was an ancient thing. It ain't ancient. It's here. It's now. Our kids and our grandkids are going to have to contend with it, looks like, for the rest of their lives. So buckle up. Get ready. The good news is, the church already came through this. The church already survived this. Jesus was not defeated by this. Yes? The way to kill sin here is not, according to Paul's words, is not to kill it at the level of deeds, behavior. Stop looking. Don't click to that channel. So on and so forth. The way to kill sin is to kill it at the level of desire. Desire and not deed. Deed will flow from desire. As desire is attacked, knife between teeth, yes? There's your image for the day. As desire is attacked, deeds will change. So I'm not soft on deeds here. I have deeds in mind. We have to recognize that we have to identify our cosmicus epithumius. Verse 11 of Titus 2, 
wicked passions. Wicked passions, whatever they are. And we have to, when they surge up in us, as they do for you, and as they do for me, and as they will, they will try until the day we die. When these things surge up in us, unasked for in many cases, unplanned in many cases, even to some degree, unwanted. But when that rage surges up in you, what's the way to kill it? What's the way to practically help people in your church attack that sin? It's to help them, yes, not go into the rage fit, of course, but it's actually then to do the pastoral theological work of helping them see that the instant such a desire arises, they should confess it and repent of it to God. That is the way to start killing desire and wicked passion. It is not to cut off the weed at surface level. It is to get your gloves on and go underneath where the outside of the weed is and get your hand gritty and dirty and dig in amidst the worms and whatever those teensy little silver bugs are and pull that wicked weed out by the root. And the practical way we do this in spiritual terms is we confess and we repent the instant we experience a sinful, wicked passion. Your goal then, what I'm saying by extension, it's not simply to avoid an affair, let's say, if you are married or single, I suppose. Your goal is to overcome the power of lust which desires to master you. Your goal, by the grace of God, by union with Christ, is to call upon Christ for his power over temptation in the moment and repent of that temptation and confess it. To God. This is not true only of sexual sin. This is what I have special reference to because of my assignment today. This is true of every sin. This is true of gluttony. This is true of pride. This is true of jealousy. Uh, this is true of a whole cornucopia of sins, recognizing, of course, that there are sins that not only offend God's will, but offend God's design. More on this in a moment. Nonetheless, this is the plan. This is the plan for every sin for every one of your failings and my failings, it's to attack them, not simply at the level of deed, but of desire. That is when you and I will begin gaining victory over sin. But listen, younger evangelicals in particular are not hearing this kind of line today. This isn't some heroic theological insight cooked up by me. This is basic Bible, basic Bible, right there for all of us to see. But we are hearing that we should simply stop doing the bad deeds, and then we should sort of marinate in, you know, the realities of love which has washed over us. We're so broken, we can't grow, and yet love has washed over us. That is not what grace does. Grace gets in you, and grace causes you to grow. And part of that growth is the hatred of sin and the desire to be an athlete, to be a warrior. Kill your sin. That's a crucial part of this story. Second, we men must discipline ourselves to win a woman's heart. Not every man is called to marriage. Do not misunderstand. Singleness is an honorable calling when given to the Lord. Much more to say there. That is at the very least what we need to put down. 1 Corinthians 7. So let that be said. Let that be believed. But most men are called to the holy estate of marriage. One of the fundamental marks of manhood, therefore, mature manhood, is that we honor the design of God for Adam and his descendants. In fulfillment of Genesis 2.24 and the creation mandate of Genesis 1.26 and 27, we leave father and mother and take one wife for ourselves. There is so much more than mere procedure here. Find wife, win wife, marry wife. This is a call to holistic maturity and wisdom and righteousness. We men fill the role in the marriage that is occupied in God's cosmic redemptive vision by Jesus Christ. That is, we are called to be earthly heads, I boggle to say these words even now, like Christ, even as wives are called to submit to their husbands like the church. Here is the Bible's strongest word to men, to lay down their lives like Christ, the warrior king, remembering that his death is not a death merely of service or of sort of 
expression of love. His death is an act of war that destroys the power of the devil. Remember this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and what? Gave himself up for her. He died to purchase the church. He did not die to make salvation possible. He died to make salvation certain. And he succeeded. Here's some good news. He succeeded. Your salvation isn't a possibility. Your salvation is a certainty. Not because of you. Not because of me. Because of Christ. That's what Ephesians 5.25 plainly teaches us. It was this death that protected the bride. It was this death that destroyed the devil's reign. It is this death that is our model, men, married men in particular, for life. Men shaped by Christ, the warrior king, then put their lives on the line. Not to save their wives, we can't save our wives, but to bless them, protect them, and strengthen them. Young men won't get this kind of vision in a day. Biblical doctrine is made to be modeled. Our boys need to see this way of life modeled and lived out. Third, we men must discipline ourselves to pursue manhood. Every man, whether married or single, must hear the upward call that is in Christ Jesus. And we're trained today, as I have already said, to scoff at a call to manhood. To hear it as sort of some sort of call to be some kind of macho man. Manliness. You know, it sounds like you want to, I don't know, go out to the woods and tear off your shirt and, you know, pound your chest in the morning air or something like this and then catch fish with your bare hands and fight off a, a bear at lunch or something like this. Actually, that is pretty manly. But uh, that is not, that is not first and foremost anyway, what we mean by manhood and pursuing manhood, though some of those things are definitely, definitely recommended if you can pull them off. By the power of Christ's atoning cross and empty tomb, we must embrace our God-given manhood. Manhood is not fundamentally defined by American culture or any culture, except biblical culture. That's how manhood is defined. Though there are implications of it in any culture, and, and there are some wisdom issues in any culture. Uh, we, don't have, we don't have nothing to say about the entailments of manhood in all sorts of areas, but this is the core of manhood. It's God-defined and God-given. So we hear David's call to Solomon afresh in our time. Be strong and show yourself a man, a dying father to his son. He said that. Be strong. Show yourself a man. And how does he go on to define strength? Righteous strength, yes? The strength of godliness in the First Kings 2 passage. Read it. Read it later and see. Manhood is defined most primarily in terms of godliness. Loving the Lord. We recognize that Paul called an entire church to act like men. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, being edited out of our modern translation. This means that we must train our sons to be strong in the Lord, to be self-controlled, to love Christ, to hate evil, and to sacrifice themselves for women and children. This is comprehensive training. It is theological training that is accomplished through regular devotions in the home, of course. It is also accomplished in the ordinary living of life. Before I go on a trip, no perfect father, but I, I take my eight-year-old son aside and I tell him that he is the one who is watching over the girls. I have a wife and two, two daughters, so three women in the house. And I say to my eight-year-old son, um, I say to him, this is, this is your duty. You gotta protect the girls. You gotta, you gotta be strong for your mother. Okay, you gotta be a helper for her. You, you gotta think about ways that you can you can bless these girls, you know, hold the door and bring in the groceries for mom and these kinds of things. This isn't perfect training. This isn't some super uh, amazing new way to, to train boys or something. This is basic. Praise God that God made it pretty basic for us men. I think he knew something about us. It is this kind of man who is going to help women. Our culture is not hell itself, but it is not set up for the flourishing of women. Our culture today, American culture today, tells us to not commit sexual abuse which is completely right, but it schizophrenically also tells us to do whatever we want sexually. Our culture, think about this, calls, actually like my college campus, secular college back in Maine, supervises drunken parties, as most schools now do to mitigate liability, this is real. Um, so, so they supervise parties where all sorts of young men and young women get drunk, um, 
and are encouraged to do whatever they want, provided, you know, a few stipulations are in place. Consent, right? That is a schizophrenic way to handle things, yes? This is another example of double-mindedness. Our culture trumpets, as we saw a few years ago, both Me Too and Fifty Shades of Grey. If you were watching television or on your social media, you, you would see one and then the other just a few years ago. That is a schizophrenic, double-minded culture that is not set up to bless and protect women. It says it is. It is actually set up to destroy women because there is, one, there is a figure behind that culture. There is a figure behind every culture who initially targeted a woman and initially wanted a woman destroyed. And it wasn't God. It was the devil. The devil hates women. He hates men and women alike. He hates God's creation. But who did Satan attack in the garden? And who allowed Satan to attack? A man. Many young men are profoundly confused and disordered by this kind of culture. They don't know what manhood is. They don't know what orientation they are. And they've never had many of them more than a couple sentences with their father, if they have one, about what manhood is. In a society that tears men down to the roots, we want to build them back up by the power of the gospel of grace. We must help men today in many ways. Some spelled out in scripture, that's the core, some the better part of wisdom. Allow me to list a few in rapid fire fashion before we conclude. First, we need to help men understand that they are made men by God. Their body is not lying to them. If they are a man, if they are a boy, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing despite being in a culture that is training us to see manhood and boyhood as instinctually, inherently bad. Second, we need to help men kill lust. As we have said, we need to recognize that many men are going to hell. I mean in a real sense, because of this issue. And so pastors have to be very much engaged along these lines. Godly men, forget title, have to be engaged along these lines. Third, we need to help men see that same-sex attraction, if they have it, and, and some will have it as a result of the fall, yes? Same-sex attraction is not their identity. And there is no such thing as a gay Christian. There's no such thing. There is only a Christian. That is not a statement of hostility. That is a statement grounded in theocentric joy. I am not defined by my lusts and my ungodly passions and attractions. You and I are defined only by Christ. Only by Christ. He is your life when Christ, who is our life, appears. He's everything. You don't have an image. You don't have a reputation. You don't have a brand. You have Christ. When Christ, who is our life, you can do anything and go anywhere because of Jesus Christ. You can suffer to the max. They can pull your kidneys out with a knife. Christ is your life. Fourth, we need to guide men toward manhood by showing them that anatomy and identity are one. The Bible has no support for embracing gender dysphoria. We are called to repent of any such inclinations, remembering the witness of texts like Deuteronomy 22.5 and 1 Corinthians 11. Gender dysphoria may arise in us for a variety of reasons, some of them unasked for. Yes, absolutely. There is real trauma and real victimization in this world, and yet even when it arises, from whatever reason, we must repent of it. Fifth, we must also make clear that Jesus did not experience gender dysphoria. Jesus, and I'm going out here, Jesus did not experience same-sex attraction. Jesus did not experience internal lust. Jesus was the Son of God in human form. Jesus was the perfect Messiah. Jesus never sinned, and Jesus, unlike us, didn't edge up to the line of sin. There are noted and rightly celebrated apologists in recent days who have said that Jesus experienced gender dysphoria. This is not true. Jesus did not experience gender dysphoria. We know this for theological reasons. We also have absolutely no exegetical reason ever to say that Jesus experienced gender dysphoria and lived some kind of transgender existence. Where are we getting these ideas? What is happening to us? Honestly, Jesus was like us. Yes, Jesus was gloriously like us. But Jesus was also unlike us in that he was without sin. And you have to have both or you don't have Jesus. You don't have the biblical Jesus in view. Hebrews 2 and 4. 
Six, we need to help men understand that they, mu- they may well be called to marriage even if they are not presently desiring it, even if their, their past is not oriented that way. God can do a new work. It is up to him. Seventh, we need to help men know that even if called to singleness, their desires will still be changed by Christ such that they fight and overcome same-sex attraction as an ongoing war against the flesh, the same war that we all have to fight, as I have already been at pains to say. But our identity is never, never in our sinful attractions. It cannot be. Our identity is only, as I have already said, in Christ, and challenge me. Find a Bible verse that melds together a sinful identity with a biblical identity, and I will yield the point. Eighth, we need to make clear that we are not training men to sexually desire women, if they have not previously, as if that is the end. But we are training men to renounce ungodly lusts in full. Ninth, we need to help men understand traditional traits of manliness. They need to dress like a man. They need to talk like a man with a deeper voice. They need to walk like a man. They need to shake hands like a man. They need to present themselves as a man. And they need to generally enjoy being and knowing what manhood is because God made it. Somebody out there is going to say, whoa, that is so weird that you would say that. You need to talk like a man? That's crazy. That's not crazy. What's crazy? What's wrong? What's disordered is a culture that would tell us that embracing femininity is normal as a man. That is not a sound culture. Yes, there is, of course, some variance between cultures. We can admit that. We can admit some gray areas, to be sure. We also can recognize that the scripture calls us to be men if we are men and to be women if we are women. Tenth and finally, above all, we need to spell out the roles and duties of a man, training our boys to be leaders, protectors, and providers across the board. In all this, we are praying then for our boys to be warriors, especially in the spiritual sense, to kill sin, to love Jesus, to stand against evil anywhere it's found, to protect the weak, to love their neighbor, to take the gospel of grace everywhere it is not preached or believed. This is what it means to be a warrior. It does not mean that you are against women, something like this. To be a warrior means, by grace, that you are like Jesus, who came to destroy the works of the devil. I need to to rapidly conclude here. In conclusion, we remember not only great leaders of the past, We remember the singular great king of heaven and earth. In Christ's first coming, he came as a warrior to destroy Satan's kingdom and save sinners through his atoning death. We praise God with Spurgeon. Our almighty warrior, Spurgeon said, has a sure aim. Preaching on Psalm 45, he never misses the heart at which he shoots his arrows. In Christ's second coming, Christ will come as a warrior to complete this victory and rout all who hate him. Some say the warrior motif is there in the Old Testament. It's not there in the New Testament. I respectfully dissent. The day is short. The hour of reckoning approaches. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, Revelation 19.11. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Heavenly Father, these things are too great for us. We need your strength to be men of this kind, of this vintage. Help us, Lord. We need your help today. We are in such confused times, both in the culture and in the church. We pray, Father, that we would be a renewal movement by the power of Christ's gospel and that we would be warrior, warriors in the image of Christ, the warrior king. In his name we pray, amen.